Hey, welcome back! Since I haven't looked into oil companies in a while, I decided to do a follow-up and also add a couple of new ones. With all the noise in the market, these companies prove to be quite resilient, so let's have a look. Now, the thing with oil is that it's very susceptible to the economy. We recently had a lot of fear of a recession, election uncertainty and so on, which had an effect on the price and consequently the companies that produce it. And keep in mind that this commodity is very much tied to global politics, with the OPEC having a massive influence on the price. They aren't even trying to hide the way they manipulate it by adjusting the production. So any war, conflict, tensions and so on in the region can also affect the price. To begin with Exxon, they are the largest American oil company and overall around the number 3 on the planet. They can make even as much as 60 billion in a very good environment, falling to 20-30 billion now and basically break even during the bad times. They recently bought Pioneer in a close to 60 billion deal and as a result they are now achieving record levels of production and the cash flow will also increase. I'd say they bought Pioneer because of the resources and especially the relatively low production cost that they have, thus solidifying a position around a good price. In the future, especially if politics get in the mix again, new wells will have an even higher production cost, so buying already running ones can be a more efficient way to develop. But it's ultimately a matter of time until the new ones provide the majority of the supply, meaning a potentially permanent increase in price throughout the cycle. Really quick, and remember this when we get into Chevron, Pioneer was making up to around 7.5 billion during the recent upcycle and pretty much breaking even during the bad times. They had about 37.5 billion in assets and not a lot of debt, leaving them with about 23.5 billion in equity. With synergies and maybe some cost savings, Exxon can probably make this into an overall profitable business all throughout the cycle. They have a plan to deliver about 5 billion in cost savings by 2027, which can be pretty significant and you would feel it especially during the bad times. They are about a decade away from becoming a dividend king, currently paying a yield of around 3.2%. But that's close to 17 billion and they have to keep increasing it if they ever want to become a king. That means that if we get a bad environment for half a decade for example, you will see them piling on debt as they did a decade ago. Financially, they are in a good position with the current assets covering the current liabilities and overall a ton of assets. There is about 276 billion in equity, so currently they aren't far from that level, so definitely a plus from this point of view. They also have 228 billion in treasury stock, which for a reference they can use for another 4 pioneers, so if they want to expand or need liquidity, they have more than enough. They are also investing a bit into green energy, but if you compare them to the others, it's not that much relative to their size. Still, they have all the money for it and they can just sit on the side and buy one of the companies that did all the work. Again, that financial position and the hundreds of billions in treasury stock is a huge advantage. So overall, not a bad company from a financial point of view, but historically expensive for a small dividend that can hurt them. I generally don't like cyclical companies, especially commodity producers, that pay a constantly increasing dividend because you can never know how we get a decade of down cycle and they are eventually forced to cut it. And if we get a lot of good times, they can't increase it too much and all they end up doing is buybacks at very high prices. But if we get them at uh, something like less than half the price as we saw during the pandemic, that can lock in some really nice dividends plus a pretty good profit. But I think there are better companies if I want something like this, as you are about to see. Still, not a bad company, especially for a retirement or slow dividend portfolio. Now Chevron, this is around the seventh largest oil company on the planet and number two in the US after Exxon. The stock fell a bit from the all-time high in 2022, but it's still relatively high, well above any other peak. But they seem to be taking the same approach as Exxon and they also pay a better dividend, so let's have a look. They can make around 18 to 20 billion now, which is not terrible for a 200 something billion company. They made even double this much back in 2022 and during the bad times they still had a positive cash flow. But as you are about to see with the others, for an oil company that's quite a high ratio. Historically, we can see how cyclical the cash flow can be and the stock generally follows. It's tough to see in this graph, but this is currently a pretty high ratio for them. They pay a pretty good 4.5% dividend, meaning around 11.87 billion. 
Thankfully, they barely have half a billion in interest to pay, so it should be very sustainable. However, adding the buybacks at relatively high prices, by the way, that's not enough. But the financials allow them to overpay for now. If we get into a recession or something and they have issues, the buybacks probably get cut instantly like they did during the pandemic. And that's the issue with a majority of companies, especially a dividend aristocrat, who would rather get into debt to keep paying the dividend instead of buying the stock when it's cheap. Financially, they are in a good position, with the current assets covering the current liabilities and overall a lot of assets. The equity is quite below the market cap and I think generally with this type of company, a pretty good indicator for a good price is the price to book value. They also have a lot of treasury stock which they actually plan to use. They recently announced an acquisition intention, because it still has to be approved, with Hess for about 50 billion. I like that these companies use the relatively high prices to expand and I think it can be a very smart thing to do. If you think about it, same as Amazon and all the big tech, if you are traded at a ratio of uh, let's say 20 and you buy a company at a ratio of 10, you basically pay 50 cents to buy a dollar of production. Automatically, you will have a nice increase in cash flows, profits and so on well above the dilution. It's even better if you bought and kept the shares in the treasury when they were like half the price. But is Hess, a company that made a billion in very good years and is now back to losing money, worth 50 billion? Sure, higher capex now, but that's the case for literally every company in the industry and it's not an excuse to have a negative cash flow. Maybe you think that they bought them for the assets, but after you pay the debt, you are left with about 10 and a half billion in equity, so why 50 billion? The CEOs call it a win-win, but I'm not sure they are talking about the companies. So, can you trust this management to make the right decisions in the future? What I don't like about them is that acquisition. Again, compared to Exxon, which at least made sense from a financial perspective, this one is way too much for way too little. But, sure, the dividend is significantly better now, so I can see why some people would pick them over Exxon. Yet, I'd prefer Exxon if I had to choose between the two, but definitely only if I get them at a better price, because right now they aren't really fitting my risk and reward tolerance. In both cases, the upside is kind of limited even if we get some huge jump in the price of oil, while the downside can be very significant. But again, Exxon would probably prove to be much more resilient even during the downside. But, going into Europe, we have better companies, better dividends and better prices. Before we get into that, there is also Accidental Petroleum, the Warren Buffett company. They are undergoing a divestiture program right now in an effort to improve the balance sheet combined with an acquisition. They also have some pretty good quality production and so far this year was actually the best they had in 4 years. Plus, with some design and other improvements, they managed to get a 10% well cost reduction, which is quite significant. Recently, Ecopetrol, the company they were going to partner with to buy Crownrock, went out of the deal, which can mean a higher cost for Axie. They have some pretty good assets in there, with break-even as low as 40 or less, plus, they say, potential visible cash flow improvements. It's still a developing matter, but we can see this merger and acquisition appetite even in the smaller companies. The company made as much as 12 billion back during the recent upcycle and is now getting back to the 3, 4, 5 billion they can do on average, which isn't terrible for a 50 billion market cap. They keep using the cash flow to deleverage and I saw the market talk about them having a lot of debt and I thought I'd see some 50, 60 billion, but they don't really have that much. The current assets barely cover the current liabilities, but they have a lot of assets that they can use to cover the debt, which is what they actually do. They don't pay some crazy dividend or buybacks for it to be a concern and they are focusing on rapidly reducing the debt, so it doesn't seem like such a big issue. But again, they even show how high the influence of oil and gas prices can be. They should be more than ok at 70, 80, but if there is a recession and it drops to 40, 50, then they can have issues like all the rest. So, they are cheaper from a cash flow perspective and I think the big potential is that being valued around the same as Pioneer or Hess, this could be a good acquisition target, especially for Exxon. It isn't a bad company and even if they don't pay a high dividend now, it can get significant once they shift their attention from the debt, in a few years at this rate. But again, the price isn't that good for me and I'd say it's pretty fair for what they can do now. Now, Shell, this is a Dutch company that's around the fifth largest oil producer on the planet, usually right below Exxon. 
they can make a significant amount of cash flows, being on track to make around 40 billion this year, which is great for a 200 something billion market cap. You can see that this is already much cheaper than the American counterparts and that's with a stock near all time highs. The dividend is not terrible, around 4%, but together with the buybacks, again at very high prices, the yield is quite significant. They target a more than 6% annual cash flow growth through 2030, which together with the dividends and buybacks can add up to quite a bit. They are also investing in gas, renewables, EV charging, biofuels, carbon capture and more. As you are about to see, European companies seem to be much more focused on this than the American ones. That can lead to quite interesting market dynamics in the future, especially if the demand for oil falls, because some companies will be more ready than others. Financially, they are in a good position, with the current assets well above the current liabilities and quite a lot of assets. Again, the equity isn't far from the market cap, but you have to keep in mind that normally with oil companies it's a bit below, so no company is that cheap from this point of view. They need something like 4.5 billion in interest, so on such a cash flow and even the one they had in 2020, this isn't a problem. So I'd say this is more attractive than the American companies from pretty much any point of view. Good dividends and buybacks, focus on green energy and very good cash flows. But again, not at the current price, because this environment can still be considered the upcycle. Now, Total Energies, this is around the sixth oil producer on the planet by revenue from France. For a 150 billion market cap, they can make a bit more than Chevron, so they are about 40% cheaper. They also pay a pretty good 5% dividend, plus even more in buybacks. This is, by the way, slightly more of a natural gas company, making pretty much half of the revenue from that. So, by default, they have the potential from hydrogen and the transition that natural gas offers. But that's something that I want to cover in another video where we look into LNG companies, so make sure to subscribe if you want to see it. By the way, I'm now a Mumu affiliate and they have some really nice sign up bonuses and the overall platform is very competitive. You can get up to 15 free shares depending on how much you deposit plus a very attractive interest on the uninvested cash, so if you're interested, check out the links below to see if you're eligible. Financially, we see once again a very similar balance sheet. The current assets are a bit above the current liabilities and they have a lot of assets. There is about 120 billion in equity on a 150 billion market cap, so a price to book ratio of around 1.25 in line with the other oil and gas companies. One thing to note is that there aren't that many treasury stocks in these companies, so that's something pretty unique to Exxon. Again, that can offer a lot of flexibility in the future and I'd be surprised if they don't buy other companies relatively soon. They are also investing a lot in green energy and we can see even very recent purchases as they expand. They want about a third of the capex to go into low carbon energies by 2028. That's 10% more than what they plan to invest in new oil and gas projects, so it's pretty significant. Plus, add the potential from natural gas and hydrogen as I said and this can get quite green by the end of the decade. So, if you want a pure oil play, you don't have that many options in the US and Europe other than royalties. Maybe infrastructure too, but that's often coming with natural gas as well. Sure, there is also storage, but that can be very volatile and I doubt it's for everyone. So, overall, I think this is a good option for exposure to oil, gas and green energy. Financials in line with the market, nice cash flows, good dividends, so not bad. There is some potential to grow thanks to the green tech, but again, not a buy right now for me. Now BP, this is a British oil and gas company with a very interesting focus on green technologies. They make almost the same as Chevron, but they are valued at a market cap that's like 3 times smaller. Of course, such a discrepancy allows much better dividends and buybacks at a smaller payout ratio, so from a value or dividend perspective, this has much more potential. They are investing a lot in traditional oil and gas, but also green products like biofuel, EV charging, hydrogen, renewables and more. They already target a positive EBITDA from a couple of them by next year, so at some point it's gonna become something that they can compound. You might expect it to be greenwashing and just something they do for their image because it's BP and they have such a reputation, but they actually invested a lot of money and they do a lot of things in that area. You can see on the screen what they did in the past year. So a ton of deals, acquisitions, expansion, even some agreement with Tesla. And all of this while paying a very competitive dividend plus buybacks. 
Financially, they are in an okay position with the current and non-current assets above the respective liabilities. There is about 82 billion in equity on a roughly 90 billion market cap, so not very far from a book ratio of 1. We can see them investing a lot in green energy and even if all the companies in this video do that, the difference is very significant. For being among the smallest companies in this video, they are investing more than some of the giants, so this might be much more than greenwashing. They seem to be genuinely focused on making this the company's future. As I said with Exxon, the latter may just buy a company that does all this investing if they are successful, assuming that such a deal gets allowed. Even without them, this can solidify a very good position in this industry in the first years when they have an advantage. You know, maybe get some green contracts with a few governments and companies, reinvest that money and compound. If they manage to do that, this has the potential to become a leader in the market. But don't forget about this company's history. This is after all the company whose, uh, quote, reckless conduct and gross negligence were behind the biggest oil spill in history. I think they still pay for it and maybe they were able to learn and adapt from what happened. But keep this in mind as a general risk for any of them because accidents can happen and they can be very expensive. So overall not a terrible company and despite making the same as Chevron, they are valued at like a third of the price. This is the only company in today's video that is still below the pre-pandemic level. Again, such a difference can always attract a potential buyer because if you trade at a ratio of 20 and you buy a company at 10, you increase your cash flow more than you potentially dilute. Add the green investments and you can see the potential. We can see a clear difference between American and European companies and if we look into South American companies for example, the difference would have been even bigger. Now, American companies will likely always be more expensive because number one, it's the US, so the theoretical level of risk is lower, plus a few other factors. For example, American index funds like the S&P normally allocate based on the market cap. That means the more expensive a company is, the more you buy when you purchase the S&P. That's how a handful of companies make up like half of the index. So there will always be kind of an artificial inflation because almost everyone buys that, meaning that there is very strong demand. Europe, on the other hand, is much more fragmented and the demand is nowhere near that of the S&P. Plus tax, dividend benefits, pension interest and similar things. But on the other hand, as we can see, this can lead to better dividends and even less money from European companies. Then, if you go even further in South America, you will see some 10, 20 percent or even higher dividends. But that's all about the risk and reward perceived by the market. For example, let's look into Petrobras, the largest Brazilian company. We can see the same market cap as BP, a dividend that's three times higher than Chevron's and a cash flow similar to Exxon's on less than a third of the revenue. So from this point of view, by far the cheapest and most attractive company in the video. They have a very low production cost, so the real risk in case of a recession for example is much smaller. The downside, political risk. You never know who comes next and adds some terrible tax for foreigners or does some nationalization, which to be fair is extremely rare. But is such a low ratio justified? Financially, they are pretty much in line with the others, with the current assets almost covering the current liabilities but a good amount of non-current assets. The equity is almost the same as the market cap, so again similar to the rest. They have a new and more predictable dividend and buyback policy, representing a payout ratio of 45% of the cash flow. So that should be something close to 10 billion per year now, meaning a total yield of around 11%, plus potential for special dividends. They even said there is the possibility to see a special one this year. They have a new plan from now until 2028 with some higher investments for a bit and then decreasing to a more normal level. A majority of the money will go into exploration and production which has by far the best rate of return. They also plan to invest a bit into gas and low carbon energy but it's not that much. The advantage they have is that they sell to China and India which may focus on oil for much longer than the US and especially Europe. So from the looks of it, I think this might be the optimal, let's say pure oil play with some massive dividends. With such a production cost, they can probably make good money almost no matter what and if I manage to get them for something like 10, I think it would definitely be worth it. There is higher risk, but I don't see South America as such a risky place to justify this disparity. 
Plus, there is potential to see another commodity boom, which back then made this a more than 300 billion company. Not to mention the potential to see more interest in emerging markets as the rotation from tech may spread into value. And that's actually something that might be beneficial for all oil companies. But again, it's about the risk and reward that the market sees, which is what decides the price. This can remain much cheaper for decades, but at least they compensate with the dividends. So, I think investing in oil, as with any other commodity, is a matter of not timing the market, but doing it in the right environment. I don't mean waiting to get to the lowest price possible, but this is something that I'd buy when the market doesn't want them. You know, the panic in 2020, I don't mean picking them in March as the pandemic was blowing, but later in the year, when some of them crashed even more, this could have been a time to buy, because the market hated them for months. So, right now we have fear of a recession that can be terrible for oil, but also rate cuts that should boost the economy. So, there is potential to crash, but also potential to do pretty well. The thing is, the time after any of those should be pretty good, so it's a matter of what level of risk you are willing to take. My strategy is finding a couple of good companies, and you can see some of them in this video, plus maybe one royalty for high dividends and waiting until we get into the right environment. I wouldn't buy right now because even if there is a boom in the price of oil, there isn't that much potential. As always, what I cover in my videos shouldn't be enough for you to make any investment decision, so please do your own research before investing in anything. If you want to see more videos like this one, please leave a like and even a comment to help me out and make sure to subscribe. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.